When you hear this, what do you feel? At IMAX, you'll feel transported by our unique sound system and crystal clear images. Like you're running across a desert planet or defending your city from a surprise invasion. With immersive IMAX sound and screens curved to show more, we take fans to the edge of their seats. Get tickets to Dune Part 2 now and experience it in IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. In 1999, director George Lucas and star Liam Neeson gave the world a stunning new entry into a galaxy we all long to return to. And ten years later, everybody lost their crap and decided they hated it, even though when it came out, it had mixed to solid reviews, <laughs> even getting a three and a half stars from famed movie critic Roger Ebert. But I digress. In 2024, we try a rare whiskey from a non-distilling producer. The film is Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. The whiskey is Calumet 14-year single rack black label. And we'll review them both. This is... The, the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And I suppose it's that time, Brad. Bob, I am so excited for this episode. Can I can I ask one question, Brad? Uh, you can ask as many questions as you want, Bob. Why? Why are you excited for this episode, Brad? Because I love this movie, Robert. Uh, folks, today we are reluctantly... Uh, some of us are reluctantly diving back into the world of Star Wars for the first of what seems like, I don't know, eight more times this season. Uh, we are dipping our toes in George Lucas's pool. And folks, I don't know what temperature the water is. It, it seems to agree with Brad, but it's a little oh. too, a little too cold for my taste. It's a beautiful, like 104 degree jacuzzi. <laughs> just chilling. Is that is that what you really want life. is to just chill in a jacuzzi with George Lucas? Yes, I would kill to do that, Bob. <laughs> that would be so much fun. Just have a beer with George Lucas. Ugh. Brad, I have been thinking about this episode for a minute now because I watched this movie, I don't know, five, six days ago. I've had a good long time to sit and reminisce and ruminate. And When's the last time you watched it? Uh, five, six days ago. B before that. Uh, I watched it during COVID. I, wa I watched all the Star Wars movies again during COVID because like with some of the other classic films uh, in, in the American catalog, I don't like them that much. And I keep thinking that, you know, everyone likes these. So it's got to be something wrong with me. And maybe oh, that is. thing will will reverse itself someday. And so I keep trying. It's like with 2001. I keep trying. And. Uh, alas, Brad, I am I am just <laughs> allergic to the the Star Wars. So I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I think, Brad, what I would like to do today, with your permission, is I would like to reverse our roles today. Not in Ooh. terms of like I'm not going to do Brad explains or anything like that, but I'm very aware that I talk a lot, Brad, and I think that the the yeah. split of talking on our podcast instead of being fifty fifty, it's it's like 6535. Like I talk much more than you. I think it's more like a 67. Uh, yeah, I was going to say 7030, but like, you know, I I'm yeah. trying to temper <laughs> expectations a bit. I do that because I feel very passionately about the movies we talk about. And I frankly am not that passionate about this movie. Now, I I will also say up front, I'm not coming into this as begrudgingly as I thought I would. I think there is a lot to like in this movie and I don't feel antagonistic towards it. I also don't feel ambivalent towards it. Like, I'm ready to talk about the movie. I just, when I look at my list of notes, if I was leading the discussion today, Brad, I think this episode would be about 35 minutes long. Because I just, it's one of those things that I don't really know where to go with this. And you, as a guy who's super passionate about the movie, I think can guide us through the film a lot better than I can. So if if you're feeling up to it, man, I'd like to kind of turn this episode over to you to be our our guide. You can be our Virgil guiding us through mm. the layers of hell that is the prequel trilogy. <laughs> Here, here's the thing, Bob. 
uh, this is this is going to blow your mind. Why why we're ready for this role reversal? I have a page of notes. Mm, a whole page, and and that's a first. You did it, man. You th- you wrote <laughs> a one page document. I did. Uh, now, when I say one page, it is like you know, like the Amazon notepads mm-hmm. that are that are like like a know, five like, by seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. It's one of those pages. I thought you were going to say you typed it in like eighteen point <laughs> Comic Sans. Do you remember in college when like a professor would be like, you can have one note card of a cheat note card (laughs) and people would like print uh, whatever, whatever they are, like a five by seven note card (laughs) and they would print in like size six font every fact from the entire semester. Is that what you did here? No. (laughs) First off, I would walk into those tests without a note card because who has time to make a cheat note card? Mm. Just be smart. Uh, Come on. Yeah. Fair. Secondly, uh, I don't I don't need much preparation to defend a movie like this, but I just was so excited to talk about it that I had to write things down. Uh, you know what? And like, again, I'm not going to be snarky with you about this movie today. Yeah. And no, I think I, that, I trust you, Bob. Like, I think the, the, the weird place I'm in is that I thought that I was going to end up being in the Brad G. I didn't really care for this movie. And so I'm going to, like, tank the audio. And I don't feel like that either. Like, it's it's fine. It's a fine movie with some really bad acting and some some pretty bad special effects at points and also some really great filmmaking in some stretches, too. So like, I, you know, I don't feel any any worse about this movie than I did talking about Independence Day or Armageddon or any like there are things oh. to appreciate here for sure. Uh, but you just have to lead me your horse to water to drink of them. <laughs> Hey, I'll, I'll lead you to the waters. I, don't, I, I can't make you drink. <laughs> and I'll say on my side of it, Bob, like the the prequels are a step down from the originals for me. Not a not a massive step down, just a, just a small one. The 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 sequels are a massive step down, but we we've already gone over that, and we'll <laughs> go over it at the end of the season. I think that my stance on the prequels has always been that they are incredibly fun. They're great filmmaking. The sound design is light years ahead of its time, as were the originals. And the acting's not great. Mm-hmm. And I like. I think the same thing could be said for the originals, except for the fact that Harrison Ford is just beyond incredible. I think Mark Hamill is great. Carrie Fisher's great. Like, There's just so many great actors and actresses in those films. Mm-hmm. And you just don't quite get that as often in the prequels. But other than that, I I really love these movies. I'm not going to sit here and say it is the greatest movie of 1999. Like, like there there are other movies that were better movies than Star Wars Episode One. But man, the mixture of revisiting this film as an adult and appreciating how great of a film it is, and having the nostalgia attached, mm-hmm. just has me real jazzed. Well, let's carry that jazz music and that jazz feeling into our next segment, our first segment of the day, which we call Brad Explains. Brad's going to give us the movie plot with only 60 seconds ticking on the clock. So let's go ahead and hear your take with this little segment that we call Brad Explains. Brad Explains is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen. This time, I'm going to say this is your, I don't know, 30 (laughs) second time watching episode one. No, see, here's the thing, Bob. You, you watch movies 30 times, legitimately. <laughs> I've probably seen The Phantom Menace eight times. Okay. Maybe 10. So, like, that is an extravagant lot. number for you. For Yeah, not for me, Bob, for the average person. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody, any human being alive in America, the most they've probably ever seen one movie is like six to eight times. I'm going to disagree with you there. And we don't need to get off on a tangent here. I'm definitely, if we're on the bell curve, Brad, like I'm definitely way far (laughs) over on one end. In the 99th plus, bro. (laughs) I I think especially for people who grew up like we did in the era of Betamax, VHS, or DVDs, when they were the primary way to watch movies, when people had movies at home, they watched them a lot, dude. And I think that you just grew up in in a household that didn't watch movies that often. and so. Legitimately, for you, eight is a lot. But if you ask the average person, what's your favorite movie of all time? Or like, 
how many times did you watch The Lion King on VHS when you were a kid? Like, 30 is on the low end for some kids, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, but does that really count? Watching it 30 times when you're six years old? Is, is wow. that an actual view? I guess I guess you can't love things as a child, according no. to Brad. All right, dude. Unable to. You have one minute on the clock to spoil this movie. You should be able to do it because you've seen it, as we've established, eight whole times. So, Brad, <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours, man. And go. The Phantom Menace is a film where the Trade Federation is controlled by Lord Palpatine of the Sith, and they invade the peaceful planet of Naboo. Jedi's Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi attempt to negotiate, but are nearly killed in the process. They rescue Queen Amidala of the Naboo and go on an adventure to, that detours onto the desert planet Tatooine. There, they find and free a slave boy named Anakin and have an incredible pod race. They continue on their way to the capital planet Coruscant. There, Amidala pleads her case before the Senate, realizes it is pointless, and flies back to Naboo, enlisting aid from unexpected quarters to defeat... The Trade Federation. Mm. Did you write this down? This sounds written. I did. Yeah, I was going to say that was that was so much more eloquent than what we normally get. And here's Thanks, here's man. how I know that is because usually you start. I can hear you collecting your thoughts. I can hear inside mm -hmm. of your brain because you always start with Armageddon is a film about such and such. And I always think it's mm -hmm. so funny, dude. I just like we are on a podcast <laughs> called Film and Whiskey. If there is one given. It is that you watched a film. We know, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I still started with that. Oh, uh, that's true. I mean, I think you're just honoring a time-tested tradition yeah. at this point. Yeah. Oh, I, of course I am. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will say this is one of those movies that either I was going to give a really esoteric, like, 12-second, mm -hmm. or I was going to hit the 67-second mark and get bogged down in the details. And I, I wanted to strike a nice balance. Now, is it because this movie is so bad that you had to affirm that it is, in fact, a film? No. The Phantom Menace I, I, is, for the record, a film. Fun fact, as you just said, I've said that for every <laughs> single movie we've ever reviewed. So, no, it's not the fact all that right, it's... All right quote unquote a bad film <laughs> all right man let's jump into talking about the movie and i'm gonna hand it over to you i'm gonna sit back and rest on my laurels here i want us to i want to talk about the characters bob because mm. i i think that the acting is not great on a lot of different levels accurate i think i think that ewan mcgregor liam neeson are both stellar mm -hmm. in their acting I think that Natalie Portman is like a B minus. She's like pretty solid in certain mm. points. And then she kneels down to uh, to to Boss Nass and goes, no, I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, George, couldn't we have taken like any other take of that and put that in the film? <laughs> but overall, I think Natalie Portman is solid. Uh, Jake Lloyd is terrible. Can, can we just agree on that and leave it leave it be? Yeah, we can agree on that. I, I truly, truly regret and and abhor the treatment of him that led to him having yes. some mental health issues and everything. Like, mm -hmm. don't don't give child actors so much crap, people. Like, it's okay to yeah. admit now with some distance. Like, no, it's not good. Yeah, but like, he's just a kid, man. What do you want? Yeah, yeah. And at that point, it's George Lucas for choosing him. And maybe even for like for directing not him. yeah for directing him and not giving him the right notes and just the fact that you know maybe you get a few days into it and go you know this isn't quite working out yeah like let's let's, like, let's get go kid grab number two and Haley here. Joel Osment off Sixth Sense and bring oh. him over here oh dude <laughs> yeah Brad I think one of my big not fears but as a noted non Star Wars fan. And I don't consider myself a Star Wars hater. I'm just not like this is just not my thing that grabs me and causes me to nerd out. Not your cup of blue milk. <laughs> yes. Drunk out of clearly plastic glasses. Like where is <laughs> the plastic production <laughs> happening in this universe? In every Star Wars movie, it's like a Dollar Tree plastic cup. What are we doing here? OK, anyway, not my cup of tea. However... The prequels are always really interesting to me because I can never pin down with somebody like you who grew up with the prequels. So this was like these were your Star Wars movies. You know, the 
the original trilogy was kind of inherited, but these are the ones that came out when you were of the right age to start watching Star Wars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, here's and, the thing, though, about the originals. Uh, it's not like my parents passed them down to me. Like, like one of my best friends in the world, Mike, he like his parents passed Star Wars down to him. Sure. They love Star Wars. My parents, it was just like VHSs that we had. And when I was probably six or seven, I, I started watching them and mm -hmm. I really liked them. And then The Phantom Menace came out and I went and I remember being scared of Darth Maul. Sure. And... Like, I, I liked it a lot, and, and then the second one came out, and I liked it a lot, and then the third one came out, and I skipped school and saw it, and it was really cool, because I was like, what, 15, 16 mm -hmm, at that point? Mm -hmm. And it, I think it was around there that my fandom really cemented itself, because at that point, I, I'm playing Star Wars video games. I'm reading Star Wars books from the 80s and 90s that are just incredible, and, I, you know, the movie is coming out, and... And I think that's kind of the era where it really got cemented for me. So my point was going to be, I, I wonder how hard it is, and I'm not accusing you of anything, but like, I wonder how hard it is to separate the prequels from the legacy of the original trilogy, or even from the sort of like narrative, like shared narrative knowledge of the original trilogy. Like we know who these people are because we've watched the other movies and these are prequels. And so... Every time there's like a fan service -y thing of Qui-Gon first being like, now, now, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I can just hear an audience in 99 going like, oh, he's the guy from the movie. You know, you know what I mean? But <laughs> Leo pointing at this movie. Yes, screen. exactly. <laughs> I want to talk about this movie as much as it is indebted to those other movies. I want to talk about it in a vacuum because I think that this is where Lucas's writing and directing really suffer sometimes. I think he relies a lot on your prior knowledge of these people. And sometimes that's an okay thing to do. You don't have to give tons of backstory because A, this is the backstory. And and B, like you just make passing nods at certain characters and that's fine. But I, I'm wondering, Brad, like, do you, when you watch this movie, do you think of it as a piece of a big hole or do you evaluate it solely on like, if this was the first Star Wars movie, would you think differently about it? You know what I mean? Yes, is the answer to your question. <laughs> like, Because I, like, I, I think that when you take, especially The Phantom Menace, I, like, I think that there's two characters, sorry, four characters that we know from the later films. There's Anakin, there's Obi-Wan, there's C-3PO, and there's R2-D2. Mm-hmm. Other than that, not a single character in this film, as best as I know, Star Wars fans, you can come at me. That's fine. I mean, the if Emperor. Somebody else. Okay, sure. Yeah, the Emperor. Um, so five characters that are known in the later films. Pretty much everybody else is not a known character. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's easy to come into this and treat it in a vacuum to just say, all right, like, what do we have just here in this film? Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I think you are off on the wrong foot already, Bob. I think that the writing in this film is great a and not not necessarily the dialogue. Like, as you have informed me many times, like the script is not just the dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. everything that goes into this movie. I actually think that the story here is really well done. And the characters are are really interesting and they they flesh each other out in really fascinating ways. All right. So I am going to disagree with you a little bit. Yeah, I, man, it's so weird being not in the driver's seat of how these conversations go, Brad. I, I'm in the Brad G role today. Yeah. Um. So here's what I'm thinking about the writing of this movie. Uh, like we've both established the dialogue is not great. We'll get around to examples of how it's not great. That's fine. There are great moments, though. Oh, for sure. Like, for when, sure. When Qui-Gon goes, the ability to speak does not make one intelligent. It's, it is it is one of the most priceless lines I think I've ever heard in a movie. When we did episode three, I think you were kind of shocked by how much I appreciated the grand overarching narrative of the, the prequels. I think that, mm -hmm. like, taken as one huge meta story. It's really cool what George Lucas did here. Yeah, I think that it also kind of when it doesn't work, like I think, you know, episode one and episode two are obviously weaker films than episode three. 
And so to some extent, it works less well in both of those movies. And I think that when it's not working as well, it's almost to me like the story that these movies are telling is almost a more compelling Wikipedia article because you at least see what the broad strokes that are being painted are. And I think if this movie is the only thing you have to go on, you don't have prior knowledge of the the you know the original trilogy. I think this movie's kind of a mess like in terms of what the through line is because you know even if you look at the Wikipedia on this movie, Lucas says that he's trying to tell five separate narrative threads, but it's not that they're intertwined with each other. They like are supposed to uh, logically flow from each other. And the big main overarching thread of episode one, according to Lucas, is Palpatine's power play here, mm -hmm. which is fine and which is good. Yeah. I just think that like if Palpatine is kind of the quote unquote main character here, we need to see a little bit more of his wheelings and dealings. I think you need to just like abandon the the ruse that we don't know that he is Palpatine. Like they even to the end of the film, they're still shrouding him in shadow. Like we don't know it's the same guy. And the audience is what one step ahead of where Lucas thinks the audience is or or will allow the audience to go because he's like, I need to save that for the second movie or the third movie or whatever it might be. The characters themselves are interesting characters, but the choices that he makes in terms of who to develop and how much to develop each of those characters, I think that the calculus is just a little bit off here. Uh, it's it's hard for me to fault Lucas for like narratively choosing not to reveal Palpatine earlier, like because he knew he was making multiple films. Mm -hmm. Like, like I'm with you in like, let's evaluate this film on its own merits. But part of its own merits are that it was made to be part of a trilogy. Sure. And, and so I like, for me, I think it's, uh, this is going to sound like a Marvel defense, but like, that's kind of part of the appeal of the, the prequel trilogy is that you get to see this story through all three films and so the the Palpatine of it all, like per, pretty much everybody knew that, like you know, Palpatine, Sidious, they're they're all the same person, even sure. as you're watching it. And so I, I think it's to me, it makes it much more sinister of an antagonist that, like, he is behind the scenes. He's showing up in one form to the Trade Federation and showing up in a different form to the Senate. And he is getting all of his enemies to attack each other and weaken each other. And then he doesn't come in and destroy them all. He comes in as the hero sure. to save them all. And, and again, and I, like, like, I, I think that's a really great touch. I think the, the decision, though, to keep showing the, uh, you know, the Darth Sidious side of things as like a hooded figure who just happens to have the same chin and mouth as this other guy that has the same voice, like have a scene where we see him say like, okay, see you later, Amidala, and then turn around and put his hood up and a hologram pops up of the Trade Federation guys. And then, you <laughs> you know, like we know the reveal that Lucas doesn't actually show us. And, and I'm thinking of like, you know, Lord of the Rings in, in the Fellowship. The second you see Christopher Lee come on screen, you're like, that mother the bad guy. Like, look at him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, even but even before he gets revealed as the bad guy, it's like you know what's coming here, but you still need that turn for the audience's sake, for the character's sake. And even if he doesn't want to reveal to the characters within the film that this is the bad guy, I just like I just kept wondering, like, why are you still doing this whole thing at the end of the movie? Because Man, I, we're we're we know already, George. Yeah, but like. Wouldn't that be too much telling and not enough showing? I mean, it, they did like, it to with Saruman to... in the first movie, and he lasted through three movies, or, you know, two and a half. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know what I, I mean? Was... Sure, but I don't know. This this doesn't feel like a sticking point for me. Like, to me, it's a... I think that this is Lucas doing a great job of show, don't tell. Like, mm. he shows you that he is the villain. He doesn't tell you that he's the villain. And, like, look at the character of Darth Maul. Darth Maul is one of the best written characters in the entire Star Wars universe because he is set up 
as the embodiment of evil. Like, tell me you didn't see him as a 10 year old child. Oh, he's, and yeah. Go, that is a pure demon. Now, like, he so, is. But here's the thing, man. Like, the character design, the makeup, the lighting, like, all of the all of the filmmaking things that aren't on the page are what makes him a good character, though. Like, because as an adult, you go back and watch this movie and you're like, oh, this dude's in the movie for four minutes and 12 seconds. And like, yeah, and I feel kind of cheated out of what should have been a character that lasted many films because he is such an inch. He looks different than any character I've ever seen in Star Wars. And he's like, he sounds so intelligent and his, like he has the coolest lightsaber I've ever seen. He is clearly the equal of these guys in terms of fighting with the lightsabers. Like, I don't think Lucas wrote a great character here, Brad. I think and, he's I think he's the most underwritten of all characters in this movie. But that's the beauty of the character. He has all of those things, and he is a pawn in Sidious's game. Like, like that's the beauty of Darth Maul. He represents everything that the Jedi fear. He's terrifying. He's a demon. He has incredible fighting capabilities. He's manipulative. And then at the end of the film, they ask, like, is he the master or is he the apprentice? Sure. And they don't know the answer to that question, but we do, because Lucas has been showing us throughout that he is not the master. And it, But it sets up for the characters within the universe this, this uh, ambiguity that's really important to understand why the Jedi do mm-hmm. the things that they do. You make a great and point. I, like, I'm just saying, give me... 12 more minutes of him. <laughs> like, that's, I don't need him. You know, even if you say, okay, I'm going to kill him at the end of the first movie, though. Cool. But like, let's have two more fight scenes. Like, let's, you know, let's have three more lines of dialogue. I want to know this guy a little bit before you off. Yeah, him. I, I, I don't totally disagree with you. I would, I would love to see more Darth Maul fighting. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best-selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. An unlikely friendship begins in the Paramount Plus original movie, Little Wing, starring Brooklyn Prince with Kelly Riley and Brian Cox. Reeling from her parents' divorce, Caitlin steals a valuable bird to save her home, but instead forms a bond with the owner, leading to a new outlook on life. Little Wing, now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Rated PG 13. And like, you know, speaking of of fighting, I, I just saw Dune two. Mm. Fun fun fact in theater. You're mm. welcome, Robert. What a great theater going experience Dune two was. Yeah, uh, I saw it in XD. Oh um, man, I've I've been told that Dolby is the way to go. Um, so, so like XD but... is is Cinemark's answer to IMAX. It is a floor right. to ceiling screen, and it is more widely available than IMAX, and it's more affordable. And so I am a huge proponent of seeing stuff in xd that's just an aside I bring, sorry yes totally <laughs> which is it's okay we we should do a bonus episode just talking about the specs of like movie theaters <laughs> i'm sure it would get so many downloads i bring up dune 2 uh to say that there's an incredible fight scene near the end of the movie that I wish we had something like that with Darth Maul, mm-hmm. like like the and not like an extra one. But I wish that the middle fight scene when they're on Tatooine and Qui Gon fights him for like thirty seconds. Yep. I wish that one was a little more developed. I, I think you could have spent a little more time there, and it would have established him even more greatly as this threat. Yeah, totally agree, man. And I realized that we we were supposed to be talking about the characters in general. We probably should talk about the performances that go along with the characters, because otherwise I don't know that we'll ever get through the list of characters. We've we've spent like 12 minutes talking about two characters, Brad. So I don't know. You go ahead and introduce whoever you want to talk about. And let's just work down the list here. I want to talk about Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks. Ahmed Ahmed Best. Uh, Another person who just got like true, like like Liam Neeson talks about this in an interview where he's like. I spent, you know, however many days on set with him, Liam Neeson literally called his agent and said, Ahmed Best is the next Eddie Murphy. 
He is that funny and incredible to be around and just an awesome guy. And yeah, and Liam said, he's like, and I think his career kind of got ruined because of Star Wars and yeah. how he was treated. It absolutely uh, did. And, and not like, okay. Not okay. Same deal, though, <laughs> with, with Jake Lloyd, man. Uh, Jar Jar Binks. They, I will have none of the Jar Jar Binks revisionist history or or reclamation project. He is as bad as advertised, folks. Like, no, he's not. The the he character is, he the, literally is the not. character is no horrible. The writing nope. is atrocious. It is it is like if I could find the most annoying program for my four year old on Netflix, the writing for that and the repetitive. Uh, idiotic nature of the noises that come out of that thing's mouth pale in comparison to Jar Jar Binks. Like it is, it's like, it is like nails on a chalkboard. The And the thing is like, I don't fault the guy at all. I don't think the voice is very good. It doesn't sound super convincing, but Luke is trying to do this weird, like proto Jamaican Rastafarian thing coupled with like a broken form of English coupled with like, all of the Gungans doing the like, blah, 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 blah. Brad, it's it's terrible. And they they all go on 45 seconds too long. You are you of all people are attuned to when you think a scene is going on too long. Every single time they interact with the Gungans, Brad, it is excruciatingly horribly paced. The, this is this is just a matter of preference, Bob, because the, the, I think everything you just said is objectively false i like don't i don't know that you that you can evaluate this film without the lens of a guy that just loves everything star wars dude like it no see that that's where i think you're completely wrong i i don't just view this as a star wars fan watching this movie again and i, I watched it maybe a year and a half ago so like watching it twice in the in the time of us doing this podcast i've been able to watch it with an objective lens and i look back on jar jar and i think that there are moments with him that are not great where he's annoying and frustrating and silly and the more time i spend with him the more i think that that's kind of the purpose of the character well sure it is and i'm okay with that like the the whole the whole thing with uh the end of the Ryan Johnson one. Mm-hmm. Can't even think of the name of it right now. It's called The Last Jedi. Ugh, what a garbage movie. The thing with The Last Jedi that a lot of people loved and were pumped about was like, oh, he's reintroducing this idea that anybody can be a Jedi and that anybody can have an impact on the universe. And then they come, the same people like you, they come and they all over Jar Jar. And I'm like, the entire purpose of Jar Jar is to say that even idiotic, bumbling nobodies can have an impact when they have a good heart and when they are kind to the world around them. Brad, they can have an impact on the universe. And without Jar Jar, you don't have uh, any of the end of the film. OK, like, like, listen, I'm not arguing with the function of the character. Like, I know what he's there for. I know what he's supposed to be doing. He's his dialogue is awful. His character is grating and they let his scenes run too long. Like that has nothing to do with it's not that I misunderstand. And I know he's supposed to be annoying, but you can still convey the the character's annoyance with him without pulling your audience completely out of the movie because of their own frustration with him. Like that, I, I'm not alone I'm here on on thinking that Jar Jar is a hindrance to the film. And I'm not alone in saying that that's just not the case for a lot of people who watch this movie. Sure. Like okay, his but scenes don't. You, you said people like you, Bob, praise yes. The Last Jedi and then shit on Jar Jar. And, and essentially because we don't understand the function of Jar Jar. First of all, this has nothing to do with The Last Jedi. And also, like, I, I get Jar Jar. I just I just don't think it's a well executed character. I think it is. Cool, but you don't have to say that like, you don't have to say that I'm too dumb to understand it because of that. Like, I, I just, yeah, oh, man, we got to work through some characters here because that, now I'm starting to get angry. I feel like I have been as generous as possible with your take on this movie versus my take on this movie. I would hope that you can be equally generous when we get to some of the later Star Wars films this season because, Brad, like, you know, I just don't think it's a controversial statement to say, like, 
yeah, I don't think Jar Jar works. And I'm defending the guy who played him because I think Lucas did a poor job writing him. But like, I, I guess I can't, I can't say that. I think that Jar Jar is a character who has been pooped upon too much. And I will defend him because I don't think he's the best character in this film, but I don't think that he's the worst. Oh, I, like, let's do I, that. Who's the worst character in this film for you? Jake, Anakin. Uh, but as a yeah. character, not as a performance. Like, I'm talking like the the writing of the character itself, the dialogue oh, within within the yeah, within the world of the movie, like who is not fleshed out enough who or who is like just an unnecessary character? Like who's the worst at accomplishing what this story wants it to accomplish? Oh, that that's an interesting question. I've not thought about that question before. All right. So we've talked about. Ahmed Best, we've talked about Jake Lloyd. Justice for both of them. I, I agree with you, man. They have been crapped on too much. I think it's yeah. fair. And I think what I'm trying to say, Brad, is like, I, I said this with the first Star Wars. I don't think George Lucas is good at directing actors because he's worked with some all-time great actors. And almost without fail, the worst performance they've all ever turned in is when they were <laughs> like performing with George Lucas. And I think it mm. says a heck of a lot about the the charisma of Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher in particular. That like they did not fall victim to this because even like Mace Windu in this movie, though, you could tell the directions that he was getting from Lucas. He comes across more more as an asshole than as like a a guy who knows more than he's letting on. Whereas like Yoda still Yoda's like, oh, this dude knows something, but he's not a dick. Mace Windu is just kind of a dick in this movie. And I think like. How do you mess up having Samuel L. Jackson on set? How do you mess up Natalie Portman? How, like, it, you know, it's just it really surprises me that more people didn't say, you know what? Maybe like some of the problems we have with this movie rest on George Lucas's shoulders and we shouldn't take it out on this 10 year old kid. Sure. Yeah. No. And uh, Bob, I've I've always said to you that his weakest aspect of being a director is directing actors for sure like, like that i i've always said that that's his issue i just think that the characters he writes are not as poorly conceived or executed as people think hmm. I, I think sometimes the acting isn't great but the characters themselves i actually really think are well done and there's a lot more uh th there's so much more intent behind the characters and ability to advance the story that I, I just I, I think Lucas is really good at writing characters. You know, what? I, I will agree with you that I, I think there's like a confluence of things happening. I think it's the writing is kind of poor for especially for the dialogue with some of these characters. I think the direction is pretty bad and it leads to bad performances. And then the fourth thing is, I think sometimes this movie just could use a little bit of tightening up in the edit. And it's not even like I'm not even advocating for whole scenes to be cut out. It's it's one of those movies where we note sometimes, Brad, that like there's a two second pause between the time that somebody finishes their line and then they cut to the character mm -hmm. and then you watch the character react. And every line with Anakin's mom, whose name I believe is Shmi, but they don't actually yes. say her name. Like, I don't think at all in the movie. <laughs> um, like, Sis is not good in this movie. And I think it's not even necessarily because she's a bad actress, although I would not say she's a great actress. I think it's because every time Qui-Gon says something to her, they cut to her and she mulls it over for like four seconds and then she reacts and then she says her line. Everything that happens before the pod race on uh, uh, Tatooine is like it, the movie slows down a lot, dude. And I I think it's all these things happening at the same time. But I really do think that Lucas could have been bailed out a little bit if they just kind of tightened up the edit a bit. Sure. Uh, yeah, the, there's definitely moments in the movie that drag. I, I think that if, to answer your question from before, I would say that Shmi is probably the poor, the poorest written character hmm. that they, they don't flesh out her relationship with Anakin enough. And the, there's not enough connection there. Like you, you need some time to establish that mother son relationship that's so important. And there's moments like I actually think the the one scene where she kind of shines is when she's telling Qui-Gon about his birth and the 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 uh, chosen one nature of it all, the mm -hmm. Messiah yeah. <laughs> nature. Yeah. Like, I think that that's actually a really solid scene between the two of them. I agree. 
And also uh, some also, weird some weird chemistry going on. I was like, is Qui-Gon oh, dude. is Qui-Gon getting some some booty while he's on Tatooine? All I have to say is there is so much chemistry between her <laughs> and Liam Neeson. It's wild. That's like <sighs> that's probably the thing that completely flew over my head as a kid that now as an adult, I'm like, oh man. Oh, they were boating Liam for is, sure. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent, dude. <laughs> I mean, listen, it's like a no harm, no foul situation. Like, you're not getting her pregnant. Yeah. The force gets her yeah. pregnant. You're good, man. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> All right, Brad, I think we're we're running a little long. Do you want to come back and kind of finish out the main cast and then go into the rest of our stuff? Or do you want to knock it out right now real quick? Uh, let, let's knock out just a few more. What are your issues with Natalie Portman? Because I like her a lot in this. There's moments she's not great. I think Natalie Portman has grown into one of the best actresses working today. I think she's been in some incredible movies. She's an Oscar winner. Um, I just don't think she was very good as a kid. And I just watched a movie for the first time about a month ago that she was in called The Professional, which is it's an IMDb top 250. I just never seen it before. It came out in like 94, I think, 95. And Natalie Portman's like the star of this movie. And I'm like, oh, man. I expected her to be like grown up Natalie Portman in terms of how good she is as a kid actress. And she's just very much had the limitations of being a kid actor. And that yeah. might just be me like reading, reading expectations back onto her when she wasn't as good. But this is this is like that. But then also, to your point, let's deliver every line in the most monotone way. And, yeah. you know, and I just don't understand, I, like the the accent when she's Amidala. Like, what what are we doing here? Like, it's not explained and I think it takes away from when she's when she's acting as Padme, very naturalistic, really charming. Mm -hmm. I loved it a lot. But as soon as she puts that makeup back on, it's like, I do not care about you anymore. Yeah, I, I think that that's I can see what Lucas was going for there. Like the the idea of a queen being regal and measured and in control of her emotions and like they very clearly lean into like like Japanese kind of kabuki tropes of like the way she presents herself and her costuming and things like that. And so I think that there is an affect that is presented that, that just doesn't totally work. I think within the world of the movie, it, it works. But I, I would agree with you. It's honestly, it's not when she has the makeup on like. The very opening scene that she's in when she talks to the Trade Federation, she has that white makeup with the red dots on the cheeks. Mm -hmm. I actually think that the the demeanor and affect works really well when she is in full regalia. It's when she's the queen, but she's not in full regalia that I that I'm kind of like, okay, like give me a little bit of emotion, like <laughs> something. Right. And, you know, I'll go back to the line I said before when she like bows and she's like. We are asking you, no, begging you. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay, honey, like, uh, sure. When you're talking to the, your enemies, the Trade Federation, don't show any emotion. Totally makes sense. When you're begging a, another military nation to come to your aid, like, give me, give me a little something. Uh, right. Just anything. <laughs> right. And I think if I can steer us into, okay, I don't even think we need to talk about Ewan McGregor because we have, we have talked about him before. He's great. He is absolved oh. of all wrongdoing in this situation. Yes. I'm I'm really disappointed in Qui-Gon Jinn. And, and oh. it, it breaks my heart to say it because from a character design standpoint, there are very few people who have ever looked cooler in Star Wars than Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon. Like, he is the prototype for, like, I want to watch a movie about this Jedi because he just yeah. looks like a guy I want to learn more about. And I think that's my thing is we don't actually learn much about him. He's just like he's he's the guy that is the seasoned vet. He's like he's kind of on his way out. He's inching towards retirement, it seems like here. And like <laughs> you don't. He's only really there to be like utilitarian, to serve the plot, to spout some exposition and to like negotiate over, you know, car parts for a half hour. And like, I just wish we had more of what's going on inside Qui-Gon's head. I love that he wants to he wants to buck the trends and like, you know, resist the orders of the Je like the Jedi order. Like, that's really cool. Why? Why are you such a rebel? Tell me more about that. And we just don't get it. And I think that's the most frustrating thing about it. I I don't understand how your brain works, Bob. You don't. I mean, I, you like, think we get you think we get enough fleshed out about him 
to make his death yes. at the end be like as impactful as it could be? Yes. Okay. Like, I, like again, I'm not knocking the performance. I'm not knocking the character design. I just think he's underwritten. That yeah. is he underwritten? I, question. Just tangential question. What would it take to make you happy, Brad? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm giving you a lot here, and I'm like, here's my issue with this character. I'm gonna elucidate it as clearly as I can, and then you're like, you're just crazy. Like, I don't. Well, I don't know, man. Like, if you don't think he's underwritten, like, what's your reasoning for thinking that he is, in fact, fully fleshed out? I think I feel so flabbergasted by it is because I've never, like, the idea of Qui-Gon being underwritten is so far from my consciousness, I've never even thought about it. <laughs> it like, it's that just ridiculous to me. I... Here's the thing with Qui-Gon. He is, in a lot of ways, the main character of this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, we spend most of the movie with him. The Like, the majority of the film is learning how he thinks about the world. And it's through him that we get the lens of what we think Jedis ought to be like for the rest of the Star Wars universe. Hmm. Like, he has the viewpoint that the most important thing we do is listen to the force. And like, he says that constantly throughout the film. And so I, once again, I feel like, I feel like you're asking for telling more than showing. Like for me, Qui-Gon Jinn shows you what it means to be a Jedi. All of the other Jedi in this film, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, Yoda, Ki-Adi Mundi, Plo Koon, not that I know all their names or anything, I was going to say, are you them, just making up sounds now? <laughs> no, no, Flargan, I, I'm not. Blurston. So the, the large scold conehead Jedi is Ki Adimundi. Uh-huh, sure. Uh, the one with the gas mask is Plo Koon. Okay, yeah, of course. Um, anyways. Stands to reason. It stands to reason. <laughs> anyways, all of them show up where? On Coruscant, they're all wrapped up in the politics of the realm and Qui-Gon is held up as this paragon of like he listens to the force and trusts it to do what what it needs to do and I and I think that that's like the beautiful thing about Qui-Gon and you know I'm gonna take the movie out of the the vacuum for a second to say like Duel of the Fates right the song at the end of the film mm-hmm it's about the fate of Anakin Skywalker and the fate of the Force. And the duel is, will Qui-Gon live or will Qui-Gon die? Because if Qui-Gon doesn't die, he goes on to mentor Anakin in the ways of the Force and possibly, like, doesn't become Darth Vader. And so that I think that's why, for me, Qui-Gon represents this super impactful character within the universe that is incredibly well acted and i think well written mm. and I, so i i guess i don't know is that a cogent defense of why yeah i think, I he's think actually it is a really well written character I, I think it is and i i do still think that sometimes you're confusing like my displeasure with you know the lack of dialogue or the lack of uh monologues that flesh out the character's backs whatever with like an inability of me to see the function of the character. Like, I think you're absolutely right. Qui-Gon sets the template for what a Jedi should be for the rest of this prequel trilogy. And you're right. Overarching like star Wars. I just wish that we got like, you know, one scene of Obi-Wan being like, Hey man, like what's, what's driving? Why are you insisting on this kid being the chosen one? And him being like, <laughs> you know, it, it sends me back to when I was like, just give me something that like <laughs> fleshes him out a little bit. Cause I want, I think it's the highest compliment for me to say, I want to spend more time with him. And yeah. what pisses me off is that we don't, we don't get that time. And I felt, I don't know. It just didn't feel like it was, his story was completed before the rug got pulled out from under us, both him and Darth Maul. Give us, oh, give us another half movie with them. Kill him in the middle of the second one. It'll be even more <laughs> shocking. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. I, oh, yeah, man. I, I, I think that's the beauty of the movie is you don't get everything you want. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I think we should drink I whiskey. Love, 
I think we should drink whiskey too. We've been going for 45 minutes, Bob. All right, let's get to it, Brett. <laughs> All right, so today we are checking out Calumet Farm Single Rack Black Bourbon Whiskey. This is a 14-year-old product. Brett, I think it's the first Calumet we've ever had on the podcast. Is that right? Yeah, I, as far as I know. But who knows? I've drank a lot of whiskey. <laughs> yeah, so have I, my friend. I keep seeing Calumet all over the place. It is, uh, you know, for the most part, a premium brand. And these like 12, 14, 15, 16 year expressions that sit on the top shelf would tell me that they are ultra premium. <laughs> now, yes. Now, because this is uh, the first time we've had the brand on the show, I'll, I'll give a little bit of backstory. As far as I know, Calumet is a non-distilling producer, so they release whiskeys, but they don't distill them themselves. They partner with a distillery, they say, that is also in Kentucky. It looks like it's it's called Western Spirits. So they're sourcing this whiskey. Uh, it's like super premium small batch. I'm reading something right now that says that this particular product is from a small batch of only 19 barrels. So they're all from a single center cut rack from, and this is a quote, Brad, from the ideal maturation location and conditions inside the Rick House. I mean, obviously it's ideal, Bob. What else would it be? <laughs> we picked suboptimal <laughs> conditions for this <laughs> limited release. Yeah, That's so they, like, they, I love when people like ask directors or something like, you know, what's a what's one of your movies you made that you didn't like? And it's like, I, dude, I like all my movies. All my movies were cut from an ideal condition. Every time they're like, was <laughs> Timothy Chalamet your first choice? Like, what are they going to say? Like, no, I wanted no. I wanted Tobey Maguire or something like, yeah. no, like, oh, it's, just, it's the same thing in sports. Right? Yeah. Like, like, oh, the quarterback, was he your first choice? <laughs> No, nope. no, he, he was not. Sure wasn't. <laughs> I hope he can go kick rocks. <laughs> okay, so 19 barrels, all from the same rack in the same Rick House. This is clocking in at 96.2 proof. I do not have mash bill, uh, you know, breakdowns here, Brad. So it could be weeded. It could be high rye. I have hey, no Bob, idea. Yeah, this is 74% corn, 18% rye, 8% malted barley. Oh, thanks, man. So it is not weeded, and it is high-ish rye. Yeah, let's dive in. Yeah, I, as I got into the nose on this, it's a decent nose. Uh, I got some orange zest, some dark chocolate. Uh, the overarching note for me, though, or I should say the over-oaking note, mm -hmm. uh, was oak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is so much oak on this. And I just, I, 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 I am repeating what the whiskey world has said for decades. But the fact that bourbon has to be aged in new white oak, American white oak barrels means that you can't go much past 10 to 12 years mm -hmm. without it becoming wildly over oak. And I'm going to say something, my own preference, Brad, through the uh -huh. years, I sometimes think even 10 years is too much. Like, yeah, especially if you're drinking barrel strength whiskey, like if we get a good Knob Creek 10 or 12, I think those are too oaky most of the time. I just do. Yeah. So, like, you know, take your Pappy 23 and do whatever you want with it. But, like, that's too freaking long in a barrel for bourbon. It just is. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you because this is a heavily oaked nose. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give it a seven and a half. I, I think that there's some nice stuff going on here, but I, I'm worried. I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah, there's some really nice baking spices under here. It's like baked apples a little bit. But the oak is so heavy that it almost turns sour on the nose it's like it doesn't smell like char or ash it's just it's almost like that toasted barrel thing that we don't like <laughs> on a lot of toasted barrel finishes brad so i'm with you i'm gonna give it a seven and a half and i think the flavor is kind of a similar story like it's a really really solid tasting whiskey that just has way too much oak that comes in on the back part of the palate and into mm -hmm. the finish I, I mean i don't know where are you falling on the palate here uh, it's, oak. it's, it's decent. Uh, I'd give it a seven out of 10. There's oak. The, the char really comes through for me. Um, there's some vanilla notes. I, I almost felt like it was almost like a sour patch kid kind of vibe that I was getting, but th there's not enough uh, complexity mm. for me. Like I can tell that it's a well-made whiskey, but it's not a very flavorful whiskey. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that's like a, a huge insult to say you, you did a good job making it and then there was no flavor, but that's kind of where I'm at. The fact that it is a well-made whiskey, I'll still give it a 7 out of 10. Um, 
I just I just want more out of it. It's an underwritten character. <laughs> it is if I it is the Qui Gon to... of whiskeys. <laughs> it looks really cool, and I want to learn more about it. But damn it, it under delivers. <laughs> so just not uh, enough there. I th- I actually think that the flavor is a little bit better than the nose. But then I think like okay, I gave the nose a seven and a half. Is this an eight on the palate? And I don't think it is. Mm-mm. So I think I'm still going to give it a seven and a half. But like you know, dear listener, in your mind, I want you to think of it as like a. 7.51. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. How about you give it a 7.51 and the nose a 7.49? There it is. Yeah, it balances out perfectly. We have brought balance <laughs> to the force. You were supposed to bring balance to the force. On the finish, I'm I'm kind of surprised because there is that oakiness, but then it dissipates really quickly. I think there's a there's a bit of a chest burn. It drinks a little bit hotter than 96 proof. Like I would have thought this was in the like 104, 105 range. Uh, it's really nice. It's a nice finish. I just, again, it's, there's nothing really distinctive about it. And there's nothing that screams, you should pay triple digits for this. So nope. like, yeah, maybe the value or, you know, what will be the value score is kind of tainting my, uh, my scores here a little bit, but like, this is fine. I'm going to give it a six and a half on the finish. Yeah, I, I give it a six on the finish. It, it falls off. It doesn't last as long as you might think, but it is only in the 90s proof. I think 96 proof. Um, it's okay. Balance wise, I give it a seven. Like, I, I think what they're trying to do here, they accomplish. I'm just not super impressed with it. Hmm. Man, what a perfect pairing for the Star Wars prequels, I tell you. What a terrible pairing for the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> All right, uh, I think we're pretty much in lockstep. I'm going to give this a seven as well. Why don't you take us to our value score? Brad, what will a bottle of this cost you? Well, I mean, at this point, it's on their own website, Bob. <laughs> they have at the bottom of the the stats sheet availability level. And the availability level of this is low slash rare. Uh, technically it's an MSRP, I believe of $120. Mm-mm. I would, Mm-mm. so I don't normally do this, Bob, but I'm going to do it. I drank this Calumet earlier today. Right now I am currently drinking a bottle of barrel rye private release that we purchased oh, at yeah. the Kentucky KBF. bourbon barrel yep. festival. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just say this. I think we paid like $85 for that bottle, mm-hmm. $90. I would pay $120 for that bottle. Mm-hmm. I would never pay $120 for no. this. Uh, I gave it a 2 out of 10 to be nice, but this is bad value, folks. Listen, it's 14 years old. It's 19 barrels. This is like the absolute minimum that this could possibly cost is like a sure. 100 bucks. Yes. So I think they're overcharging for it slightly. I don't think that it's like astronomically priced, but it is not a whiskey that tastes like the flavor of this whiskey is not worth $120. I'm going to be a little bit kinder than Brad. I'm going to give it a four and a half on the value. But again, that's just because I think it's like in the range that it should be based on the market. Yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent. Like I think Calumet is doing really interesting things here, like to make ultra select we're only taking 19 barrels and figuring out what we can do with them. Like, it's it's interesting. The juice is not worth triple mm-hmm. digits. I'm coming to a 33 out of 50. Brad, what are you at? 29.5. Mm, 29. Wow, it's been a minute since we've had one in the 20s. Yeah. So we're coming to just a 31.25 out of 50. Folks, this is what we do here. Like, you know, we're not here to poo-poo whiskeys. But I feel very strongly, Brad, as a guy who has limited funds, and I I believe you do as well. Uh, Otherwise, Mm -hmm. you should have been paying for a lot more throughout the course of our friendship. (laughs) That we have a responsibility to tell people when we think something is overpriced (laughs) or just not even overpriced, but just not worth the money in in terms of just pure flavor. And I think this is one of those one of those times. I'm I'm very grateful to our friend Wes for sending us a sample of this, but I, I would not purchase this for myself, Brad. Wes is incredible. Bob, I have a very important question for mm, you. Yes. Was the $5 bag worth the value that you got? Well, what's the value score on that bag? The return on investment of just the story itself was worth <laughs> at least $10, $5 Taco Bell bags. Oh, that's mm. good. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, let's get back into you Maybe. calling me an idiot for not understanding Star I was Wars. I say, 
Maybe our friendship is salvageable. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, everybody, that was Calumet 14-Year Single Rack Black, a whiskey that I will give a black mark to. Mm-hmm. Here, here. Here, here, here. Uh, you know what I would not give a black mark to, Bob? What's that, Brad? Canada's favorite segment, Two Facts and a Falsehood. Brad is going to try to stump you both to our right and what is wrong. Two facts and a falsehood. Two facts and a falsehood is the part of the podcast where Brad presents me with three items as fact about the making of this movie, one of which is a complete lie, and I have to suss out which one that is. I'm a little nervous today, man. You know a lot about this movie, so I think you could very easily just make up some more words about how, you know, <laughs> Blarf in the Hut did a whole bunch of stuff, and I, I'm just going to think that it's it's accurate. I don't, like... I thought about just letting you have this one, but I got screwed over by our friend Noah Gattel last week, who saddled me with two losses on Armageddon. Mm-hmm. So I went from eight mm-hmm. and two to eight and four. Just this, like that. I'm in a precarious position here, man. Yeah, I'm glad for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Hit me with your two facts and a falsehood. Fact number one, in an early version of Lucas's script for The Phantom Menace, there was a subplot involving a young Wookiee named Warka, who was intended to be a companion to young Anakin Skywalker during his time in t- on Tatooine. However, he was dropped in favor of the one and only Jar Jar Binks. Hmm. Fact number two, according to Jake Lloyd, there was a six-hour cut of the film that was screened for several people before the film was relieved with those who saw it proclaiming it to be mind-bogglingly good, end quote. Fact number three, Ewan McGregor once stated that before filming began, he and Liam Neeson were taken to a private room where two Lucasfilm employees approached them with a long, locked wooden box. When opened, they saw 20 various lightsaber hilts and that they were allowed to choose one of them to be their character's <laughs> official weapon for the movie. I like how they received their lightsabers as if they were like, in the Russian mob. Like they got taken to a shady back room. <laughs> Some guy opened a briefcase. <laughs> Pick your weapon. <laughs> oh man. Choose it now, duh. Okay. I feel like number two is true. I just feel like George Lucas really thought that he had made the great American <laughs> film here. It was like, you know what? Let's do a six hour version. That's gonna bring him in. So I, it's either Bob. one what? I would watch a six hour version of this movie. You know what? I might actually watch a six hour version of this movie, too, because I feel like it certainly can't get any slower than the slow parts of this movie. You you would probably get your your hour and a half stuff that I want. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So it's I literally was watching this with Haley and I told her I was like, I could watch like four or five hours of this. What does Haley think of this movie? Oh, she likes it a lot. Oh. Fun fact. Haley really likes Jar Jar. She thinks that he of is Of course funny. she does. Of course she likes Jar Jar. <laughs> <laughs> literally everything that I like, she thinks sucks. And literally everything that I'm like, that's not for me. It It's for Haley. We are the yin and yang holding the universe you, together. Usually hyperbolic speech is like obviously false, but uh, it is. I don't, I don't think you're far true. off. Yeah. <laughs> oh man okay so it's either one or three a three sounds pretty true as well remind me of what number one was again uh that there was a a companion for anakin oh, that was called wookie Warka. yeah yeah but it got dropped for jar jar hmm. i don't know man these are both really good um i think three sounds true so i'm tempted to say one is the falsehood but I don't freaking know, man. Yeah, I'll just go with my gut. I'm going to say one is the falsehood here. Bob, you are on a streak of trusting your gut because oh. number one is the falsehood. Oh, hey. All right, cool. I thought you were going to say I'm on a streak of losing. <laughs> no, you're not. You've been nailing it this this season for two facts and a falsehood. Here's my here's my reasoning. I figured that George Lucas was so bought into Jar Jar Binks that there could not have been another version. <laughs> like from the get go, he was like, no, no, this is the thing that works about this movie. Like we have to stick yeah. with it. 
<laughs> this is the one thing that makes sense to me <laughs> in this crazy messed up universe. Misa love Jar Jar Binks. Here, um, here's one thing I I will say about Jar Jar. Uh, I would encourage you to watch George Lucas's interview where he talks about the racism complaints about Jar Jar. Because frankly, I, I think it's ridiculous. And the racism th- complaint nothing... is ridiculous or yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Th- there's, there's nothing about the character that was meant to be, or I think is racist about it, but I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that. To the Let it be known. We're taking a principled stand here at Philbin Whiskey. Jar Jar Binks, I... not racist, <laughs> not racist character. <laughs> this episode has gone so much differently than I would have expected it to go. This is my favorite episode we've ever I'm, done. I'm sure it is, man. <laughs> Talk about cone-headed <laughs> okay. Jedis and stuff. Can we talk about the pod race, yes. please, for the love of God? Okay, so this is what I was most excited to talk to you about, because it is by far the best piece of filmmaking in this movie. Everything builds Bob. to this, and I think it builds for even too long, but it still pays off. And my question to you, Brad G, is now that you have seen in full the film Ben-Hur, mm. does it make you appreciate the pod race more, or does it make you feel a little bit like... I have now seen how the sausage is made, and I can tell that Lucas kind of ripped it off a bit here. No. Okay. I think that for a new era and a new generation, this is the Ben-Hur race. Mm-hmm. Like, like, yes, there are there. It's a very clear uh, through line from Ben-Hur to the Phantom Menace. And I'm a okay with that. Mm-hmm. Like, like, I, I think that's part of the fun of doing this podcast is that now I can watch the Phantom Menace and go, oh, oh, Ben Hur, the one of the best race scenes I've ever seen put to film, followed up by the Phantom Menace fifty years later, one of the best race scenes I've seen put to film, mm-hmm. also on a desert, also great sound design, great visuals. I I'm here for it, man. I thought it was excellent, and I also thought that it did the best job of covering up how bad some of the CGI is in in 1999. And we'll get into talking about, before we get out of here, Brad, I do want to talk about the CGI a little bit. But even at this early stage of fully CG characters, Lucas uses it to great effect in this scene because you can cover up shoddy CGI if you make it fly by at like 300 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's yeah. really like the key to this scene is like, you put a camera inside the, you know, the cockpit, whatever you want to call the seat with Jake Lloyd. And there's like minimal CG that you focus on. Like it's all there, but it's whizzing by right. so fast that it's like it looks it looks like a real environment. And I think that it's like it is so clearly defined, like what the geography of this racetrack is that at a certain point you're going to have the uh, what are the bandits called that shoot at them? The the sand people? Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, they're going to come around this curve. They're going to get shot at. They're going to go through this cave. A guy's going to hit this, like, stalagmite thing and mm-hmm. blow up. Like, it's it's very clearly laid out for you. And there's characters saying at every point, like, this is how many laps they have to go. This is who's in what place in the race. The only complaint, Brad, that I have with that whole sequence is, like, I know that Jedi Knights are, like, stoic people. But Qui-Gon, my guy, and Shmi... Can you just like cheer a little? Like I, I have never seen such disinterested <laughs> spectators at a sporting event in my whole life. I mean, I, I think that Qui Gon should be disinterested. That's who the Jedi are. I think that Shmi does a decent job uh, of showing emotion. Like, like there's a few moments where she kind of gasps and grabs her mouth, and I can easily see a world where a mother isn't like weeping in fear. She's like shocked in fear. But but I'm, I'm with you. She doesn't show much emotion. I, Qui-Gon's off the hook. He He's not supposed to show emotion. <laughs> Listen, Qui-Gon is allowed to bet some money on the side on the Celtics to win the title. And stuff. Like, <laughs> like, I, like, just let him Listen, be a Qui-Gon, fan of something. Qui-Gon was spending all of his emotion on secret glances between him and Shmi. <laughs> him and Shmi, right. man. He didn't have any. What's have going any on leftover. underneath that robe? That's my question. <laughs> All right, so his we have lights, we have touched <laughs> nope, 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 nope. <laughs> we, we have touched on the pod race. We need to no, talk no, no. a little bit. Go ahead. Hold on. Pod race. Yeah. The writing of the pod race is incredible. Uh, yeah, I just like, said that. 
No, but but even just like the structure of it, right? <laughs> Lap number one, Anakin gets stuck, mm-hmm. and we follow everybody else and learn the dangers of the course. Lap number two, we spend the whole time between Sebulba destroying his opponents and Anakin, you know, showing off how skilled he is and, you know, proving all the things that were said about him, that he's this great, uh, uh, prescient, precocious pod racer. And then lap three is the showdown. Mm -hmm. And it's just incredible writing of an action scene. Yeah. And I think that's that's George Lucas for me. Like, uh, like he has lots of flaws. He has a lot of places where he's like a C to a B plus director. But his action sequences, I think he is a legendary all time Hall of Fame director. And, and the pod race is that in this film. For sure. Like no notes on that, man. OK, I do want to talk CGI for a second because that I don't. I feel like I've said this. I'm. I am a nerd, and I'm very weird, and I acknowledge this. But like, I feel like every digital CGI house has their kind of house style of, like, when you're watching Lord of the Rings, like you know what works really well from Weta Digital. You know what they're good at. Yes. Like, yeah. The 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 translucency of the skin on Gollum is like next level stuff that no one else was doing. When you watch like Pixar, you know what Pixar is really good at. Like even from the oh, get go. In Toy the, Story, the Piper short. Oh yeah, photorealistic. But like even even in the original Toy Story, where the humans look horrifying, like their ability to replicate textures and wood grains and things like that, it's it's next level. Industrial Light and Magic. There has always been something weird to me about their CGI. It never ever fully works for me, and like the the things just seem rubbery and they don't seem like they're actually like part of the environment they feel like they're slapped in front like they have a completed shot and instead of making the the thing seem like it's a part of the depth of the shot it just seems like they held a puppet up in front of it <laughs> like this doesn't it doesn't always work for me but what i will say Brad in the in favor of this movie is that lucas was doing a lot of on location shooting and and you know, by episode three, you've got environments that are like, it's just a guy on a blue screen and everything is CGI in mm-hmm. this movie in particular, especially like that final battle scene where you've got like the droid army kind of coming over the hill. It's like, it sounds stupid to be like, oh, that's a real hill. But I love the way that the the camera shots are designed to take place in a real world setting. And then the CGI is placed into that real world setting instead of just we're going to construct everything inside of a computer because i think this movie could look a hell of a lot worse than it does if yeah. george was using his episode three mindset here sure i, I mean th- i'll say this about the cgi what year did shrek come out 2001 mm-hmm. 2002 tell me that this doesn't look 10 times better than shrek cgi i sure like, yeah although I, if you put I, shrek I, in this movie he would probably be a believable character on on Naboo. He would, <laughs> shut up, Bob. <laughs> Get the heck out of here. Here's here's the deal with the CGI. I think that the advancement of technology has done this movie no favors. I think that in 1999, it looked pretty solid. I, I'm not going to say it was like great, but I think it looked pretty good in 99, and it advanced the medium of CGI in in important ways and i that i say that as somebody who hates cgi i i think it's garbage i think in this movie it's okay i think in the second and third film it gets kind of ridiculous and i think for the same reason that you said like there's you can still tell there's a tactile nature to a lot of this movie that's really beautiful And, and i think that the other reason I'm kind of okay with the CGI is that so many of the wide shots of Naboo and Tatooine and Coruscant are just gorgeous. Like, like they are immaculately beautiful shots of these planets. And it, and it sets up just this really cool world that Lucas is inhabiting with all these weird creatures. And I think that... 4k tvs and even like blu-rays to a point like they don't do the aging of this film any favors 
I think that if you were watching this on a VHS or an early DVD in like 2001, I don't think your complaints about the CGI would be as pronounced. Hmm. All right, cool. Fair, and, fair point. And that's not me saying that you like you're wrong. I, I just think that no, no, no. It, I'm with I'm with you, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. listen, Jurassic Park looked years ahead of its time on DVD yeah. and VHS, and now on 4K, yeah, it's like, it, oh yeah, like this is starting yep. to finally look old. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. But also. Jurassic Park. And I'm saying this during a Star Wars review, Bob. Jurassic Park is a perfect movie. It's a perfect movie. (laughs) It's so good. All right, Brad, it is time for us to get to our last segment of the day, which we call Let's Make It a Double. We're near the end of the episode, so thanks for listening to the Film and Whiskey Show. Let's pair another film with this one, even if it's struggling. It's the final segment of the day, now let's make it a double. Let's Make It a Double is the part of the podcast where we pick a movie to pair up with this one. To make the perfect double feature, Brad, would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? Bob, of all the weeks, I I literally didn't even know that we did this segment. Like, that's how unprepared I am. Mm. <laughs> well, it, it's really funny that you finally decided to go to a movie uh, and see Dune. Because I am going to pair this movie with the first Dune, not the second one. I think it would Ooh. be unfair to pair it with the second one because I think the first Dune is significantly more flawed than Dune 2. Agreed. I just, you know, when I'm thinking about world building sci-fi epics that take place mostly on sand, uh, it really limits my choices here. But I think that you could do a heck of a lot worse than looking at what Lucas built in his, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It's a very kid-friendly, ultimately optimistic, bright, pretty happy movie versus like, what Denis Villeneuve is doing with Dune, which is a huge downer of a series. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think it'd be like a fun pairing in that, like, you can see what audiences wanted in 1999 and what they responded to versus what they responded to in 2019 or whenever the hell Dune came out. So, yeah, man, that's my pick. Dune won and Star Wars won. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a great pick, Bob. I am going to jump back about five years from The Phantom Menace And I'm going to pick a movie that I think uh, thematically and stylistically feels somewhat similar in the sense of adventure and fun that it brings. I'm going to pick 1994's Stargate. Hmm. I I think that that would be a really, oh, such a fun movie. Uh, I I think it would be a really fun evening of like 90s cinema to just sit down and enjoy Stargate and Star Wars. Mm Mm-hmm. Brad, I have a, uh, I have a quiz, a pop quiz for you. Oh, How man. many Oscars do you think that episode one was nominated for? Oh, I am gonna guess. Can I can I go like through a few categories? Sure. Uh, maybe this is a reach. Maybe best supporting actor for for Liam Neeson. Partially, I guess that because Liam's like established on the scene. Uh, I'm guessing best visual effects, best sound effects or sound design. Is, is it sound design? Is that the yeah, they actually Oscar? had two uh, categories for sound back then. There was sound effects editing and then there was just best sound. Oh, I would I would guess they'd be nominated for both. I don't know. We'll say two. Uh, thinking through that, I'm guessing like four to six, something in that range. Mm. Three, three. And it went oh for three, Brad. Because Ah. it was going up against a little movie that used the CGI significantly better called The Matrix. The Matrix won for best visual effects. It won for best sound and it won for best sound effects editing. So it lost to the same movie in all three categories. See, I I will say a a, an avid 10 out of 10 love. Like, I think that The Matrix might be the best science fiction movie of all time. Uh, I love that movie. I don't actually qualify Star Wars as science fiction, uh, but that's just me being a genreist. I would say, loving The Matrix, I think that the sound design, whatever the the more technical version of sound is, uh, I think that I think that Star Wars is better. There's just so much beauty to the sound design in this film like even beyond the pod race which i think is a master class in sound design there's just so many incredible moments of of lightsabers and 
uh the the sounds of the the blasters on the ships uh man yeah the sound design in this is better than the matrix overall score maybe not but how did you got duel of the fates bob <laughs> you do have duel of the fates brad that's true uh, 99 man. what a year for movies i'm gonna run down a couple here brad american beauty wins best picture uh, also competing in Best Picture, you've got The Cider House Rules, Green Mile, The Insider, and The Sixth Sense. You've got Ooh. movies such as, let's go through some of these. Uh, Hilary Swank wins her Oscar for Boys Don't Cry. Angelina Jolie wins Best Supporting Actress for Girl Interrupted. Uh, Being John Malkovich comes out this year. Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. You've got, let's see, what else? Disney comes out with Tarzan this year. It's just a really, really great year. Fight Club comes out this year. What a great year yeah. for movies, man. Your your favorite film of the year. My favorite film. You even have a, a nomination here for Best Makeup for the second Austin Powers movie. <laughs> <laughs> and a Best Sound nomination for The Mummy, which I freaking rock with, man. I love The Mummy. I have not seen any of the the Austin Powers movies, and I have not seen The Mummy. Oh, man. No, no wonder why you like this movie so much, Brad. We've got to <laughs> expose you to good cinema here. Brad, it's time for final scores. I'm going to go first because you're going to hate me. I told you this the other day, though. Like, I told you I was falling somewhere between a five and a six on this movie. And it is an infuriating movie to score because I don't dislike it. But there are just so many stretches of this movie that I think are just actively bad, coupled with many sequences of some of the best sci-fi and action filmmaking I have ever seen. And it just mm -hmm. is is just thrown together in a pot and makes the most weird tasting stew I've ever encountered. It's Delicious. like, ah, oh man, I'm going to give it a, I want to say five and a half. I'm not going to give it a five and a half. And the only reason why is because we also gave uh, Back to the Future five and a half across the board. <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to insinuate that I like this movie on the same level as that. So I'm going to give it a six out of ten. But no higher. Mm. Mm. That's disappointing. I think you gave the original Star Wars like a 7 out of 10, which is bonkers. Uh, I'm at a 9 out of 10, Bob. Okay. I think that this film has so much going for it. There's so much charm. If you want to subscribe to like auteur theory, I think that Lucas is doing exactly what he wants to do here to set up the rest of the series like so many fans were disappointed with the phantom menace because it featured a child anakin and i think that when you look at the the series as a whole it, it works beautifully because you have that innocence and that childlike nature stamped in your memory because who could ever forget jake lloyd saying yippee <laughs> right like it's now in this your memory. is pod racing Oh, man. I love it. Yeah. The, I love it. I don't even care are... that he says that. I'm like, good for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that overall, Lucas did exactly what he wanted to here. The sound design is incredible. The The worlds that you visit are gorgeous and beautiful. The the Even just the introduction, the introduction of the Gungans and the Naboo is like every other planet you've ever been to is just like aliens and humans coexisting and and you don't really know like are any of these natives to the world or are they just all transplants like here for the first time you get like no the naboo are from here and the gungans are from here and they've coexisted you know very tenuously for centuries and you feel that history I, there's just so much going on here that's just wonderful and fun and i love it and it's a nine out of ten all right, folks, there you have it. Uh, Brad has completely gone off the rails and given this movie a 9 out of 10. Uh, I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, and I really regret not giving it the 5.5 that it deserved. So we are coming to a 7.5 on average, but we'd like to know what you think. Where are you landing on The Phantom Menace 25 years after its release? You can let us know on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, at Film Whiskey. 
Or you can give us a follow on Discord. We are on there every single day talking to you guys, the fans of the Film and Whiskey podcast. So if you'd like to join the conversation, you can find a link at the end of every single one of our show notes. Next week, Brad, a film that we will be united in our hatred for, I'm predicting, the truly god-awful Ron Howard film, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. We're watching this literally uh, the week of Easter, so we are way off in our timing on this one, but uh, there's no time like the present to review whatever this is, Brad. So join us next week for that. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.